The nasty isolation prowess and perimeter clamps on the other end from the Jays, Marcus Smart's timely shooting, and Blake Griffin beautifully replacing Al Horford in the starting five were driving factors to a smooth Celtic W north of the border, sadly for me, over my Toronto Raptors. The Seas were fueled by a third quarter where they dominated the Raps 35-18, but to be fair, I wasn't at this game, and with the presence of D-Flow, Toronto's 7-1 at home, with the only loss coming to Philly in four games where I haven't been there against Orlando, Brooklyn, Miami, and this most recent game against Boston, the Raps are 2-2. Two two. Facts aside, in all seriousness, even from an opposing fan's perspective, you can't help but respect what the Celtics have going for themselves. About to take on the Phoenix Suns, who own a number one seed themselves, let's look at why Boston can't be tamed as of this recording. Firstly, subscribe and leave a like for more content like this. Just 10.1% of my viewers are subscribed, so if a higher chunk of you were, that'd be awesome. I'm also going to plug my Instagram where you can find edits like this one of Jalen Brown. Go check that mixtape out and follow at Hoops on the gram. A follow would make my day, so thanks for your support. The Boston Celtics organizational prowess starts at the top with both a consistently intelligent and aggressive general manager in Brad Stevens. Without going too much into detail about how he managed the Ime Udoka situation fairly well, taking it head on and not sweeping anything under the rug. Basketball wise, Stevens and the Celtic front office hasn't received enough credit for how they've retooled the roster around the Jays in the post Danny Ainge era. The hiring of Joe Mazzulla has proved to be a perfect one, as just over a quarter of the way through the season, and the Celtics have the greatest offensive rating of all time by far. The way they're getting Tatum open space by running off-ball actions for him and even having him set picks and roll, plus getting him looks down low in the post, and the confidence in which the Celtic shooters overall are letting it fly with should be attributed to the great coaching of Missoula. It's a cliche, but he's got the ear of his team right now. Boston has the most wins among all 30 squads by a significant amount, all without the Time Lord. Who knows what kind of monster we're going to be looking at once Rob Will returns, RW3 was a draft steal back in 2018, as he was only selected down at pick number 28. But I want to focus on specifically the year and a half after Ainge left this franchise to Brad Stevens. Let's discuss how Boston's front office has polished the roster around Jason and Jalen since that time. The trade steal with OKC to bring back Al Horford, which involved getting the Godfather in exchange for Kemba Walker and that year's number 16 overall pick in Isaiah Stewart, who of course didn't even end up on the Thunder. Getting Horford back has proved to pay dividends in 2021's offseason. The Celtics also signed Sam Hauser as an undrafted free agent and re-signed Luke Cornett. Stevens also extended Marcus Smart on a four-year $77 million deal. But prior to the Celtics winning their NBA Most 10th Conference Championship since the Eastern and Western Finals were introduced before the 71 season, the trade deadline acquisition of Derek White is something we can't forget about. The 28-year-old product of Colorado was acquired from San Antonio in exchange for Josh Richardson, Romeo Lankford, a 2022 first-round pick, and the rights to swap 2028 first-rounders. It was tough for Boston to give up on Richardson at the time, he was a valuable shooter in the system, but the Celtics are all around just a much better team with the playmaking qualities of Derek. All of those acquisitions were amazing, but after the infamous turnover disaster in 2022's NBA Finals against Golden State, Brad Stevens was well aware he had to make a move twice as good as any other deal he'd previously made. Stevens did just that when he dealt Aaron Neesmith, Daniel Tice, Nick Stauskas, Malik Fitz, Juwan Morgan, and a 2023 first round pick that's going to be of low value based off their current success in exchange for Malcolm Brogdon. I went heavily in depth on the qualities provided by Brogdon for the Celtics offense in this video right here. Statistically, in 22-23, Brogdon may only rank number 14 among all bench players in points per game. However, among bench players who've played at least 20 games and average at least 20 minutes, Malcolm's 62.7% true shooting mark is 5th best in the association, only behind Josh Green, Larry Nance Jr., Damian Lee, and Christian Wood. It can't be overstated how much of a luxury it is for the Jays to have the scoring efficiency of Malcolm, who makes just under an incredibly efficient 50% of both his three-point looks and overall field goal attempts. Malcolm recently spoke on his time in Boston up to this point, saying, quote, This is a treat. I think for any NBA player, whether you ask Marcus Smart, Tatum, Brown, anybody, it's a treat on a team like this, end quote. 
This past summer, in addition to trading for Brogdon, the Celtics signed Danilo Gallinari, who tragically suffered an ACL tear. Then, in a late offseason steal, on October 3rd, Blake Griffin was picked up. BG hasn't gotten consistent minutes, but he's been really solid whenever Missoula needs him on the second night of a back-to-back, -back, filling in for a five-time All-Star in Horford in the starting lineup. The six-time All-Star in Griffin posted 13 points, eight boards, two dimes, and a steal in 32 minutes against the Toronto Raptors. All that support's necessary, but of course, the Celtics aren't who they are without unquestionably two of the top five wing players in the game of basketball, Tatum and Brown. Jason and Jalen's springiness, constantly engaged energy in terms of their body language and effort, plus of course their generationally lethal ability to create space off the dribble for their size, is fuel to Boston's fire. Those qualities from the Jays are the very reasons why over the last six seasons, Boston's made at least the conference finals four different times since the arrival of Jalen Brown back in 2016. Securing championship number 18 and the first one since 2008 is the only thing that matters for this balanced and incredibly deep Celtics roster. Of course, the fan base could also care less about how many times this team's made the conference finals over the last half decade, but it's worth noting that Boston's witnessed a basketball team that many fan bases across the association would kill to watch. Boston's personnel consisting of dynamic, athletic, and floor spacing weapons is coached by a poised yet determined leader who's already established himself as one of the best coaches in the league in Joe Mazzulla. When you think about how Boston started last year as opposed to this year, it's night and day. You could argue it doesn't mean much because the Celtics turned it around so late in the year last season, but everything revolves around habits, and bottom line is, in a miraculous run last year, the Celtics had to survive the postseason after not building up good habits for a massive portion of the season. You set yourself up for success down the line by building up good habits early in the year. Just ask Golden State, who was incredible to start the season last year and felt the impact of that habitual winning in April, May, and June. Of course, it's only December, but due to all the space around them with the array of deadly marksmen, it just looks impossible to hold both Tatum and Brown in check. It's shaping up to be one of the greatest duos of this era, as the Jays are both having seasons where they're averaging career highs across the board statistically, which says a lot considering what they've already achieved. The steady development of Brown and Tatum into two of the game's most elite wing players couldn't have gone more perfectly for Boston. Again though, it helps when your two top playmakers are complemented by four of the top 11 qualified three-point percentage leaders in the number one ranked Brogdon, the number five ranked Al Horford, the number six ranked Sam Hauser, and the number 11 ranked Batman. But for today's question, what happens when the Time Lord Robert Williams gets back? Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out, and the top 5 commenters by December 21st earn free merchandise of their choosing. Today's speaks winner is Kent Saludo, who says, I have AD as 4th in my personal MVP rankings behind Tatum, Giannis, and Luka. With the MVP factoring team record and wins, I can't put AD as the favorite because the Lakers are currently 12th in the West. Tatum and Giannis both have the numbers to be the MVP as well. If AD stays healthy and the Lakers can end up as the 5th or 6th seed in the West, then I can see him winning his first ever MVP award, AD's beastly offensive and defensive game is back, and I'm really glad seeing the old AD. If AD and the Lakers continue the trajectory they're on, then I can see AD holding that MVP trophy soon. Thanks for watching, have a good one.